Hi, I'm Jenny Shampo, the director of the Book of Mormon Art Catalog, and I'm here today with Micah Christensen. Welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. Thanks. So Micah is a scholar of European, Asian, and American fine art and decorative objects. He earned his doctorate in the history of art from University College London. He's a partner at Anthony's Fine Art and Antiques, and that's actually where we are here today in Salt Lake City, and co-author of the Dictionary of Utah Fine Artists. And um, in 2016, Micah co-founded the Zion Art Society and Zion Art Podcast, documenting the careers of LDS artists, which I highly recommend. It's a great podcast. Today we're looking um, at the scriptures in Mosiah chapters 1 through 3. And the piece that we're looking at is by Arnold Freeberg. It shows King Benjamin and Mosiah. It's from the early 1950s. And this is a, a graphite on paper, so a drawing. Um, Micah, can you first tell us a little bit about how you found this piece? And, and I know there's a whole collection of his drawings that you've worked with. That's right. So Arnold Freeberg uh, was not originally from Utah. His family were immigrants from Scandinavia and they settled in Arizona, of okay. all places. <laughs> and while they were there, when he was, uh, I think he was eight or nine years old, they converted mm -hmm. to the church. And um, he didn't actually set foot in Utah until almost 30 years later. So he, um, he, he as a young man, studied by correspondence first, and then the Art Institute of Chicago, and then the Art Students League of New York. Oh, wow. And he came to Utah with a little bit of an attitude that he was different than, that more sophisticated than everyone else. And he was kind of a loner. We had had a gallery here in Salt Lake since 1984. I don't believe he ever sat foot in it, mm. or stepped foot in it, that yeah. is. Mm -hmm. he, um, we got an invitation to his house when I was in my 20s and he was in his early 90s. He died at age 97. So I think the first time I met Arnold was in uh, 2004, 2003, around there. And um, I was just there as part of the family. I wasn't, hadn't done my art degrees yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, we went to his home and it's, uh, it was in Olympus Cove, which is right along I-215 I on the bench, of the east bench of Salt Lake City. And uh, we started a friendship for the last several years of his life. He passed in 2000, oh, I'm gonna get this wrong, I think 2010, um, right around there, give, give or take a year. Okay. And we didn't hear anything. His children, or his stepchildren, I should say, uh, are estranged from the church, were not raised as, as LDS, they were actually raised as kind of anti-Mormon Baptists. And they took his art collection to Colorado. And we started to get a call from them saying they were interested in selling his work. Now, this may be too much detail, <laughs> but they were actively destroying his Book of Mormon and LDS themed works. Really? Yes. We convinced them not to do it. Even at the end of his life, his, uh, his second wife, who uh, was not a fan of the church, was having him repaint many of his uh, Book of Mormon Christ scenes mm -hmm. as New Testament scenes. Oh. So they didn't relate to the Book of Mormon right. anymore. So um, we were thrilled to get, we feel like we kind of saved them from destruction, about 300 Book of Mormon drawings. Wow. That he did. 300. 300. Okay. And they were all over the place. Some of them were just scraps of paper. Some of them were on letterhead of wherever he was. So he would be in, uh, we, have this, we have this pink pen um, Moroni annotating the scriptures mm. that he did on hospital letterhead. And when we asked where it came from, that was the day he had a colonoscopy. Okay. So you can imagine the kinds of things we're getting were everything from scraps that were from the early 1950s mm. to some of them were monumental. Right works that were on um, on butcher paper that he would roll out and butcher paper is not meant to be archival right. so it would it, this butcher paper was fragile and fraying and flaking oh, sure, and we'd yeah. have we, we took out of those 300 things I think that maybe you know half of them went to a conservator in order to, to, to survive okay 
Yeah, it was, it, it, it's even now, we have things that crop up occasionally in his papers that we're able to find because we have boxes of them. That, and I know you've done some scholarly work in trying to contextualize and just figure out what it is that's right. All the pieces represent. Um, and you've done a couple of publications on this, right? Yes, we did an exhibition when it first, uh, when when we first got all of the things that we had. There were there were the clearest, best of the best things, mm -hmm. uh, framed, cleaned, restored, framed, and we put on an exhibition of I think five hundred works. Oh wow! And we borrowed from a few people too, mm -hmm. um, and uh, those included. Um, a number of the studies that related to his 12 Book of Mormon scenes. Mm -hmm. And if you'd like, I can tell the story of that commission. I would love that, yeah, please. Okay, I'll give you the short version of it. So the short version of it is that Arnold moves to Utah in, I think, 1947. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's an interesting year because it's right after World War II, and um, the, uh, the, the, the university is growing, mm -hmm. And the old guard is kind of passing away. J.T. Harwood, who had been yeah. the leader of, right. of, of Utah artists for a very long time, who was on staff at the University of Utah, had recently died. Okay. And they expand the program at the University of Utah to include commercial illustration. Mm -hmm. So um, Freeberg gets a position as an assistant professor of commercial illustration. And commercial mm -hmm. illustration was, I mean, it was everything from signs, yeah to magazine font, right. to fashion drawing. Okay. And that's the kind of education he had. He called himself his entire life an illustrator, not a fine artist. Hmm. And he was very much anti the fine art um, environment as he saw it. He considered that to him meant modernism and nonsense. Okay. Right? <laughs> so he would say art doesn't have three or four levels. It's got one level. It's easy to understand, it's intelligible, yeah. everyone can see it, you don't need an interpreter in this nonsense world of critics. Mm -hmm. He didn't like that, any of that world. Mm -hmm. And he created an illustration as part of a church contest, I don't know much about the contest, of Richard Ballantyne in the first Sunday school. Okay. It's a painting that's now hanging in the conference center. Right, I've seen right? that over there, yeah. So he does this work and he wins the contest, it doesn't really go anywhere. He's actually making his money by doing Canadian Mountie paintings for calendars that the Canadian government and a, 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 a printing press have got in collaboration with. Okay. In his lifetime, I think he paints over 300 Mountie paintings. Wow. Right? They're all, I mean, it's a huge part of his career. The Canadians love him. Okay. Right? That's part we don't really think of. Yeah. And um, a woman named Adele Cannon Howells, mm -hmm. she is um, she, she's a, a descendant not of, of a George Q. Cannon, but of George Q. Cannon's brother, who also is in church leadership, but not in the first presidency. Okay. She doesn't grow up in Utah. She grows up in Los Angeles, and she's called by David O. McKay to be the primary general president of the church. Right. And she's the first non-Utah, Idaho, oh. Arizona person called in to do work. I didn't know that. And she was kind of seen as being, I mean, this is in the, like, the modern Utah era. We're not talking yeah. about, like, you know, the John Taylors who were not American. You had others, right? But I'm talking, like, yeah. the, the modern era, yeah. right? Yeah. So she calls in, and she thinks, okay, I'm going to change the face, bringing my L.A. sophistication to the church. And she saw Freeberg's uh, work of Ballantyne. And she says to him, I would like a proposal for 12 paintings. I don't know if we're going to do a calendar mm -hmm. or if we're going to do 12 magazine covers for the children. And I'm going to propose a magazine or a calendar to David O. McKay. Mm -hmm. The church did not have a color printing press mass publication at this point. They had an improvement era, which was kind of a newspaper-like mm -hmm. thing. They yeah. And um, she goes to David O. McKay and... Um, she shows him at the uh, Freeberg had worked for this firm doing works for the for the Canadian press, and they were um, they were like a thousand dollars a painting, wow. which is about I think I did the numbers on an inflation calculator. It was about twelve thousand dollars in today's money. Wow! And David O. McKay said, "We've never paid anything like that yeah. for a painting. We're not doing twelve of them, yeah. you know, let alone one." Mm -hmm. The church at this point had. Uh, 
famously not paid Minerva Tyker for anything, right? And they um, only paid artists to do work in temples, and they paid them basically what they paid billboard artists, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? It was like commercial yeah. house painting yeah. kind of love. Right. So um, Arnold Freeberg feels snubbed, and Adele Cannon Howells is angry at David O. McKay, and as a dying act with yeah. it in 1951, she sells her canon inheritance of family land in the valley and pays Arnold Freeberg up front mm -hmm. for the with, whole With work. her own money. With her own money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And really foists it on David O. McKay in the first presidency mm -hmm. and tells Freeberg it's paid for, go ahead and do it. Wow. And dies and there's no printing press structure and the first presidency doesn't know that it's been commissioned. And she never actually saw the finished one. Never product, saw right? even yeah. the first one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so Arnold Freeberg goes to David O. McKay, and David O. McKay says, We're not doing that. And um, Arnold says, But I've been paid. Yeah. He says, Well, do whatever you want, you know? Do whatever you want. Okay. So Arnold does eight paintings. He submits the first few to, um, to a, a contest in New York. And who sees it other than Cecil B. DeMille and Edith Head, uh -huh. who are the who are working on the Ten Commandments, right. and they need somebody to help them with costume imagining, yeah. right? So they contact Arnold Freeberg, who's terrified, by the way, at the time that he, he's just too he's too nervous about working with that big of a project, uh -huh. and he says, "Sorry, can't do it. I'm working for the church." Okay. <laughs> and then David O. McKay, and I got this from his secretary who was still alive when I did my publication, um, gets a phone call and says, hey, this is Cecil B. DeMille. Will you release Arnold Freeberg from his contract with you just to work on the Ten Commandments project? And David O. McKay says, he's not under contract with us. I don't know what you're talking about. And uh, Arnold Freeberg um, then gets a call from David O. McKay saying, this is your responsibility as a member of the church wow. to take this commission. Mm -hmm. And it changes everything because then David O. McKay takes Arnold Freeberg seriously. Okay. So, and yeah. Arnold Freeberg comes back and works on the last four in collaboration with David O. McKay. Mm -hmm. And if you went into Arnold Freeberg's house, he had Cecil B. DeMille's director's chair wow. in the living room. <laughs> And he had on an ar he had a round archway kitchen door, and in Arnold Freeberg's very distinct lettering, he wrote above it, first God, then DeMille." Oh, because <laughs> he had yeah. enormous respect for DeMille. Yeah, but he had much more of a um, antagonistic relationship with David O. McKay. Interesting. So um, he would and he would share these debates, and I got them from both the perspective of Arnold Freeberg and from his secretary. So the image that we've got in front of us of Benjamin and Mosiah, and it's actually annotated, it's got his handwriting mm -hmm. on it, King Benjamin and Mosiah, mm -hmm. dates from the first eight paintings. So the same time period. That so this is, yes, so this yeah. is from the period of before he's working with David O. McKay. Okay. And you know, there were only 12 paintings that she paid for. Right. And if you think about this from the perspective of, okay, number one, he's only got 12 to do to tell the whole Book of Mormon story. Mm -hmm. And number two, it's for children. Right. right. Right? Then what are you going to tell? You got to tell the beginning of the story, Nephi, Lehi, right? right. Got to contextualize it. Maybe you got to hit the Jaredites because they're a big part of the story, right? You got to hit the end of the Book of Mormon and you've got to hit Christ's arrival in the Americas, yeah. right? So you've probably got him there four or five out of the 12 that are definite, that you know you've got to pick a moment from those, mm -hmm. right? But then there are these images like Ammon, Abenadi, yeah. um, uh, uh, yeah, Helaman, Helaman yeah. that you don't know what image is going to be the definitive one. Mm -hmm. So out of the, I said that we had, I think I counted at one point, and it's probably more now, but we had 189 in subjects that were not the 12 mm. that ended up being mm -hmm. in there. This is one of those. So he was doing all these sketches, he's maybe trying out different scenes. That's and right. Okay. And he's going page by page. Wow. He's literally going, you can literally see, and he's annotating mm -hmm. the images by saying, mm -hmm. you know, Omni chapter one, okay. um, verse six. Okay. 
Um, and this one does not have a specific scripture because mm -hmm. it does it does relate to Mosiah chapters one through three, mm -hmm. but it doesn't. It's his own invention of a scene. Right. Right. Yeah. And I think that that is really interesting because he called himself an illustrator. Mm -hmm. Um, and illustration by definition, at least my definition in the way that I think classically trained artists think of it like he did, was that illustration rather than fine art is text dependent. Okay. Right? And so there are literal illustrations of text and then there are more abstract interpretations of a text. Yeah. So this is an abstract interpretation. Yeah. In the scriptures, we know that um, Benjamin is a direct descendant of the scripture guardians, the okay. plate guardians, uh -huh. right? Whatever we want to call them. Sure, yeah. Those who have inherited the responsibility from Nephi down to keep a record of the Nephites and and the people. And, um, and they're also, not always, but often the rulers. So we know that Benjamin uh, arrives in this land where, the, where, where, where uh, he's got to defend his people. Mm -hmm. It says he fights with his own sword. Right. Um, this is right before Mosiah 1, right? It talks about just the, briefly this kind of like young Benjamin. Mm -hmm. And then we open up with Mosiah 1 where he um, first tells his sons about the responsibility of the plates and ruling. And then he talks uh, in 2 and 3 to his people mm -hmm. as he's retiring and passing on the kingdom to Mosiah. Right. <clears throat> so in that speech, he says... Um, in chapters two and three, he says, I've always, I, I defended, even with my own sword, yeah. our freedom. But he said, if you could always have, um, he said, uh, I've, uh, I've been a king who has never taxed you with a heavy burden. Yeah, but he's and in fact, them. I've labored for my own mm -hmm. sustenance, my own, my, my, for my own needs. Right. Right. And he, and Freeberg's interpretation of this is brilliant because yep. what he has is he has old King Benjamin with a small garden and a garden hoe. Yeah, I love it. I love that interpretation. <laughs> just kind right? of propped there, like he's just set it down and sitting, yeah. sitting in his chair, coming in from the garden. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, it, it doesn't say. Yeah. It doesn't say in the scriptures. And you didn't feed me, and I had my own garden, yeah. and I didn't tax you guys to give me food, uh -huh. right? Yeah. No, it's, it's the interpretation is from, from Freeberg is that King Benjamin is ruling the country as this kind of, um, <clears throat> this kind of Roman ideal mm. of, of, a, of an early general uh -huh. who retires from the farm to defend the people and then goes back to the farm when he's done. Oh, yeah. That, like Numa, Numa, uh, the Roman general. Was it did Cincinnatus? That. Didn't Cincinnatus you? did Cincinnatus, that yeah. too, apparently, right? <laughs> yeah. It's the idea that, you're, that he is this... He, he, he's this, um, the ultimate ideal of a, of a selfless leader. Yeah. And he's sitting there and the younger Mosiah, who doesn't have a chair, yeah. comes and kneels down. Yeah. Yeah. And what I don't know here is whether or not the idea is that, it says that after Benjamin gives a speech mm -hmm. in chapter three and um, gives the people a new name, yeah. essentially kind of re- Covenanting, giving them a new covenant mm -hmm. as God's people, um, uh, that they also he also gives them Mosiah as their king, right. who's this theocratic prophet, seer, revelator. We know because of his later experience, mm -hmm. who's a righteous king, mm -hmm. but we know he lives for three more years. Yeah. Benjamin does oh, okay. after that, and I wonder if this is one of those moments when this is how I interpreted it. Okay. Benjamin's old, he's retired, he's gone back to the, to the, to the vegetable patch. Mm. And Mosiah has been king and is coming back for counsel. Oh, interesting. That's how I interpret it. Okay. Right? Yeah. So he's, he's already the, they're, they're, one's retired and, and he's sitting there with the thought, yeah. this, uh, this Benjamin. It's almost as if Mosiah is saying, okay, dad. <laughs> What would you have done in this situation? Yeah. I need your counsel. And you can see Benjamin is, he's not looking at Mosiah. He's <clears throat> lost in his own thoughts. That's right. Maybe Mosiah's 
delivering this message. Yeah. I mean, this is conjecture. Sure. I'm sure there's room yeah. for all kinds of interpretation in this. I, I also wondered if this could be that moment in Mosiah 1 where Benjamin has called Mosiah to him to tell him you're going to now be the protector of the plates and the that Liahona and the sort of Laban. And we want, you know, I want you to be the next king and I want you to call the people together. So, yeah. I could see that yeah. interpretation too. Yeah, but I like what you're saying about how he... He seems to be thinking about something he wants to, to say. To Maybe yeah. this is also, mm -hmm. it's, it's autobiographical on some, all artists, right? Yeah. We see in art who we are. And uh, I, um, I grew up in a family that had an art and antique business. Yeah. And um, I had another career. And when my father had a health scare, I came to take over the business. Oh. And um, now um, we work together. He's in his late 70s, he'll be 78 this year, and I'm 44. Okay. And um, this could be him and me. Oh, I love right? that, yeah. This could be, this could, and yeah. I keep this one in my house. Mm -hmm. This is one of the few drawings that I've kept for myself. I feel like these chairs that you have here for us even <laughs> remind <laughs> they me of work, they could a little this bit. kind of ornate, old-fashioned <laughs> sort of chair. Yeah. It's, uh, oh, that's, see, this is in your house. This is, I keep oh. this in my house. This is not one that's for sale. So the ones that I keep in my house, I've got this, I've got one of um, uh, Lamoni's wife and Ammon collapsed on the ground. Oh, okay. And I've got the fur and I've got a drawing that um, if you've got time for a story, is a, um, it's, so David O. McKay and Arnold, maybe the most famous argument they had was that uh, Arnold Freeberg knew that he had to do Christ arriving in the Americas. Mm -hmm. So he depicts um, Christ on the steps of the temple Oops. with his arms out, mm -hmm. Torvalds and Christus like, or even better, um, Caravaggio doubting Thomas like. Okay. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And people are coming up and thrusting their hands in his spear wound, touching his hands, his feet. I have the sketch that he showed David O. McKay for that. Okay. And famously, David O. McKay says, no. We're never doing this because we do not pick Christ directly. Mm -hmm. That is, there's a reason why we say Melchizedek priesthood instead of the the, the priesthood after the holy order of the Son of God. Mm -hmm. It's because out of um, respect for Christ's name, yeah. reverence, mm -hmm. we're not going to repeat his name in vain, yeah. and we're not going to do it in images either. Okay. Um, and um, we're because if we do, and this is what what uh, Freeberg said. David O. McKay thought it'd be on every t-shirt and lunchbox and book cover and Christ would be everywhere like he was a commercial figure, okay. like a Hollywood star or something yeah. like that. And um, I argued, Arnold Freeberg said, that, um, that when we, we were created after God's image and when we saw him, when he came down for his second coming, we would know that we were like him. And so this is a doctrine that's essential to us as Latter-day Saints, the resurrection, the second coming and um he said so david o. McKay only let me do that tiny little light of right. christ coming down and that's the painting right? that's the, the painting in the little, end yeah and he said and then when david o. McKay died i won <laughs> because he did do <laughs> he's a curmudgeon because then he starts because then after he dies the church commissions um harry anderson to do mm -hmm. the, the the images that were in the conference center for many years that are now some of the most reproduced yeah. And they, there's kind of an explosion of mm -hmm. Christ images that are yeah. done after David on the King. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, I mean, you and I should talk about this someday. <laughs> but there's a, um, there's a master's thesis that somebody did at BYU in the 1960s or 70s about David O. McKay as an apostle over Latin America banning the use of the cross. Oh. Because he also was against crucifixion imagery. Mm -hmm. And so there's, this, th there's some interesting parallels between... Freeberg's Book of Mormon Images, what David O. McKay has mm -hmm. already in his mind about what's appropriate mm -hmm. and not appropriate, yeah. and what Arnold Freeberg sees as being the future of LDS art. Wow. Um, well, two very different approaches. Huh? Two very different yeah. approaches. And in the end, you know, Christ's image is everywhere. Though. Yeah. It, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Going back to Benjamin and Mosiah, um, I was looking, I couldn't think of many other images of these two figures together. We have, you know, a lot of images of Benjamin on the tower delivering yeah. his speech. That's right. There aren't a whole lot of images of Mosiah and very few of them together. Um, there's one by Jorge Coco. There's 
one by Robert Barrett of Benjamin conferring the priesthood on That's Messiah. Right. Um, and there is one by Jerry Thompson from the Book of Mormon Stories manual. That's the one I remember growing yeah. up yeah. with that Benjamin yeah. that Benjamin image. Um, you know, I don't. I think I don't. He he doesn't really do many Benjamin images that we found, mm-hmm. uh, or many Mosiah images. Oh, okay. Um, we have a Zenith image. Okay. I yeah. mean, yeah. <laughs> like you've seen too, uh-huh. right? I, and it's something I wonder about. It's something that I haven't quite figured out. Is um, Freeberg, Freeberg clearly borrowed from some of Minerva Teichert's compositions. So he, he was aware of her work at the time? He or? had to have. I don't know how. Can you give me an example? Of so it? if you look at her um, baptism of the waters of, of Mormon, uh-huh. Freeberg's is almost an identical composition. Mm. Mm. If you look at her Abenadi, his Abenadi is almost like very, very similar to the two of them. No one's written about this. This is me, mm-hmm. right? But it's very clear to me that he saw them on some level. Mm. I don't know. I don't know how, and I don't know um, why. Um, but I and I don't know if Minerva Teichert. Um, I know that Minerva Teichert had a relationship with Alice Merrill Horn. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that after Alice Merrill Horn dies, she participates in exhibits. And I know that her works are on view in various levels. In um, this is at a time too. You have to remember that the church is not the central builder or commissioner of art in chapels. Right. Right. And so you have a wild west of stakes mm-hmm. and wards yeah. commissioning Tyker to do work. So Tyker is leaving Cokeville mm-hmm. and showing her works to stake presidents and okay. bishoprics. Mm-hmm. Right. And there's a possibility that he's seen them in some yeah. form. Mm-hmm. And she'd also, um, she was a, a pretty avid publisher of novels and pamphlets. Mm. And so there's a possibility that maybe he saw them there. I don't know yet. It's that's, a question. That's really interesting. But it's, yeah. it's mm-hmm. clear that he, he saw, and some of these are not, that are, are, are his version mm-hmm. of her work. Yeah, I mean, just thinking in my mind about those two examples you gave, I can see how compositionally they're similar, but there are differences in there the, are differences. the figures. I and mean, I think Teichert's Abinadi is, is a younger man, whereas Freeberg's Abinadi is a much older man. It still looks yeah. like a theater. Like, you've yeah. got, you've got, you've yeah, got, they, um, yeah. you've got King Noah, mm-hmm. who's up on a stand on the mm-hmm. left, mm-hmm. right? And then you have a Benedi in cha- like standing with his arms open, yeah. and you've got kind of this this Roman step theater, mm-hmm. which is, and, and then you've got all of this kind of costume work right. that's going on. Yeah, and there's a very similar Freeberg composition. That's so interesting right? too, because Tiger and Freeberg both were involved with theater productions that's right. and that's right murals and these kinds of things. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. and so you've got this. Um, I, I think it's pretty unlikely that he came up with it entirely on his own. Huh. And it reminds me of another story that I that I had when I first met Freeberg. Okay. So I go into Freeberg's studio, and um, he had on his... And I was young and naive. I was in my early 20s. And um, he had this reindeer with a Christmas wreath around it. Okay. There was a cover for a Saturday evening post that he was commissioned to do. And it looked almost exactly like one that Norman Rockwell had done. Uh-huh. And I said that. <laughs> How dumb could I be? Right? I said, hey, that looks like something Norman Rockwell had done. Yeah. And he goes, Norman Rockwell? Norman Rockwell would have painted any old deer. I picked the perfect reindeer. I picked the perfect right antler from one, the perfect left antler from another, the perfect right ear, right ear from one, perfect left ear, and so on. Eyes, nose. He'd come up with a composite of like 30 different reindeer uh-huh. to come up with his perfect reindeer. And this is a very um, platonic, viscery way of looking at of the role of a fine artist mm-hmm. is to come up with the ideal version of nature. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh-huh. And so one of Freeberg's um, ways of looking at art was he would he would maybe I think he would borrow from other artists and he would talk about this occasionally but he saw theirs as a first draft mm. and his own as the idealized perfect version of okay. it. Okay. Oh right? okay. yeah. And so I think that, that may be a relationship. 
I think that um, another thing that I want to say about this in the era that it was created in is interesting because Freeberg, at this point, he's working in Utah, he's in isolation in his own studio working. That's the first eight paintings and the first two thirds of the Book of Mormon, really, mm -hmm. that he's doing on his own. Mm -hmm. And then he um, goes back and he does, he goes, he does the, um, the Ten Commandments. Yeah with uh, Cecil B. DeMille, Charlton Heston, all of these, these uh, famous actors. Right. And we have in all of his sketches, um, all of this, in this, this stuff that he's doing on set of um, Charlton Heston as, as Catherine Roy and I, right. Charlton Heston as Alma the Younger. Right. Joseph Charl Smith, Joseph, right? Yeah, Charlton Heston as Joseph Smith. Yeah. Um, Cecil B. DeMille as Alma the Elder. Yeah. Um, so he's, he, and he starts um, this whole new group vocabulary, this lexicon, mm -hmm. appears in the later four paintings that aren't in the first eight, right? Oh, okay. And so this first eight images that we're working on mm -hmm. are, um, are, are a little more um, uh, 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 narrow in, in the scope, but they're all, there's also another aspect here that I wish, this is the one of my greatest regrets in his estate. He left behind his National Geographics. Okay. And I didn't think much of them at the time. And then I saw somebody who did buy them. And he has in them um, all of these pieces of paper where he highlights a belt that he saw in an Aztec uh -huh. illustration. Because what happens is when he really gets into those eight, those last four, uh -huh. is he goes, um, he, he asked David O. McKay, what his interpretation of who the Nephites and Lamanites were. Mm -hmm. And they tell, and he says, go talk to the anthropologists at BYU. And our, uh, Vern Swanson in 2000 did for BYU Religious Studies mm -hmm. a publication where he talks about um, an assistant or a student who was a graduate student at the time who overheard the conversation with Arnold Freeberg okay. and the head of the anthropology mm -hmm. department. And the head of the anthropology department says, I don't know who the Nephites and Lamanites were. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you, okay. right? How do I know, Yeah. right? And, and so Arnold says he went back and no one was going to tell him what the Liahona actually looked like. They weren't going to tell him the size. They weren't going to tell him the materials. They weren't going to tell him like yeah. any of that stuff. We just don't know. But he had to actually paint it. Mm -hmm. And so it was on him. And he said he knew the moment he won that battle when he went to a fireside in his stake and Bruce R. McConkie, who is very scriptorian, right, shows up with a replica of the Liahona that had been in Arnold Freeberg's painting oh, and okay. held it up and said to everybody, this is what the Liahona looked like. Oh. And Arnold laughed and said, not until I told you what it looked like. That is amazing. Right? And, and so I, he pieces together from the National Geographic all of these, mm -hmm. these costumes mm -hmm. and all of these figures and he said he tried to solve the problem of a, what Nephites and Lamanites looked like by creating a spiritual race. Which when people tell me, oh, they all look like muscle men. Mm -hmm. I say, well, you know, he called them spiritual Olympians. Yeah. In his mind. These guys are kind of that. Yeah, right? I mean, Mosiah a little more. You can see the, the muscles there on the arms. But, and it's, but it's symbolic, right? That it's he said symbolic. It their spiritual strength that he's, again, this try to make it very easy to read and illustrative so that you can look at it That's and right. just, it makes sense immediately to the viewer. Yeah. I mean, it's the problem with, a, with an illustrator. I mean, yeah. if you've got, if you've got um, somebody who's an abstract artist or somebody who's going towards the abstract, you could do a stick figure on fire and everybody would know it was a Benedict. Right? I mean, you could <laughs> yeah. totally do that. Yeah. You could do, I, I'm waiting for somebody to do a stick figure Book of Mormon series. Mm. And because we're all literate, right, as members of the church, we would understand the most abstracted versions of every figure. Well, yeah. But because he goes abstract in the racial sense towards this idea of mm -hmm. a spiritual race. Mm -hmm. And when I say race, I don't mean races in black and white right. or in the terms that we use it today, but mm -hmm. I mean in the terms that he used it, mm -hmm. which was they're not Scandinavian, they're not Anglo-Saxon, they're not French, they're not German, they're not African, they're not Aztecs, they're not Mayans they're this other group, mm. then he also gets caught in the trap of the hairdo is from the 1950s. Sure. Yeah, right? Yeah. Because 
that's what yeah. he was going with. I think this is so fascinating, Micah, because it is an important reminder that artists are making choices and yeah. that there's so much that we just don't know. And when artists are asked to depict it, they have to fill in the blanks a lot of times. Right. And I think it, as viewers, it's important for us to keep that in mind that um, these aren't photographs. They, this is one artist's interpretation, and there may yeah. be other ways to, to visualize it. Absolutely. And that's okay. Yeah, yeah. and that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> and, and he's going to get flack, and he got flack, yeah. and he still gets flack. Yeah. Right? But yeah. when I grew up, um, these were the most reproduced images of the Book of Mormon, oh, yeah. and pretty much the only other than the ones that started to appear by Barrett and Thompson and some sure, of these yeah. others, yeah. right? Yeah. I think one point Freeberg had calculated that they were reproduced over 60 million times. Oh my goodness. Wow. So if you count mm. like all the reproductions of the Book of Mormon yeah. and you know, all the other images and everything that were done, they're, mm -hmm. they're some of the most reproduced images of the 20th century. Wow. And this one didn't end up in the reproductions so that you yeah. can imagine on the cutting room floor, yeah. right? Yeah. You have to say, okay, you never really thought that a conversation with a garden hoe yeah. <laughs> between Benjamin and Mosiah yeah. would be one of 12 images to represent the Book of Mormon. Right. But it says a lot about how yeah. he just, it's almost as if he's a method actor and he's getting into the scriptures as much as possible mm -hmm. and he's scribbling and, and something like this he would have done in a couple hours really that's a couple hour sketch i i really love that it is different from the 12 paintings that we all know that there is this um familial focus which which i think is important in the book of mormon um is a, a theme throughout the book of mormon this like you said passing down this um, trust of the plates and, and care of the people and the, the gospel um, and I love the introspection and the just relationship depicted here it's different than what we see in his paintings and yeah. so it's really fun to see to see this and we're also really grateful to you for um, allowing us to put this in the Book of Mormon art catalog and happy to do it if, if you want to see more of Arnold Freeberg's drawings, um, Micah has allowed us to put them in the Book of Mor Mormon Art Catalog. We have a couple hundred in there, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think so. So you can check them out there. We're thrilled to do it. I mean, we're, we just see ourselves as temporary stewards of these things, yeah. right? And so some of these will, you know, they're not major works of art, but I think they add to the development of our mm -hmm. visual history, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think that's exactly right. They're an important document of our history. And just another, like, they, it made me think about these scriptures in a way that I hadn't before. Um, so I'm grateful to you for talking to us today about it. Thrilled to do it. Yeah, it's fun. Thank you. Yeah.